welcome back to another episode of Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii, where each week we explore more things to like about science. I'm your host, Ethan Allen, and today we're going to discuss another fascinating new innovation of filtering water. Filtering water is a really critical technology for millions, hundreds of millions of people around the globe who lack access to clean water. Uh, today, j joining us via Skype is Dr. Terry Denkovich, of Fo the founder of Folia Water. Um, Terry, it's great to have you on the show. Welcome. Hi, it's good to be here. Excellent. Thanks for joining us tonight, uh, tonight for where you are today, uh, where we are here. Uh, so, Terry, uh, just, let's just jump right on into this and, and tell us a little bit about how you got involved with this business of uh, water filtration. Well, the project started for me basically around 10 years ago. I was a PhD student at McGill University. Um, I was in the Department of Chemistry, and my project was to add an antimicrobial chemical to paper in the application of a water filter, um, which is pretty pretty broad. I could have gone many directions, um, but I started to kind of go down this uh, point of use for developing countries route pretty quickly when I saw that there was like such a huge need of people who didn't have access to clean drinking water. Yeah, exactly. There's a, uh, a real, I don't want to say market out there, but there's a real need for this in, in the third world uh, in developing nations where people sometimes have to either walk great distances to get water and basically you don't just have taps where you can turn on and get, get your water right away. I see uh, behind you, you actually got some of your uh, apparatus here, and I think this is a, it's a real nice demonstration here. Well, maybe while you set it up, I'll just say a, a few words. It's one of the key issues in a lot of places to have a, a very simple technology. And you can see our audience can see Terry just taking this piece of, essentially a coffee filter looking like thing, folding it up very simply into a, into a, a classic coffee cone shape putting it into what looks like actually uh, a, a coffee filter type apparatus, although it's slightly different. But um, in that this actually attaches, it has threaded uh, ends on both ends, so it attaches to uh, bottles. So you have a bottle of dirty water and a bottle of uh, nothing in it that is clean, that you want to put your clean water in. Yeah, actually, this is the... Right. So if you put the, this is the presumably the muddy water or dirty water. Oh, no. Get it screwed on nice and tight. Okay, and then, um, let's see. And then, yeah, now she puts the other bottle on top, the, the empty bottle on, on the bottom, and then. And this is the exciting part. All right. Where you flip right. it. And, and bit by bit, that, uh, that water now is going to filter through. Uh, and the, uh, the substance in your filter that, that's doing the antimicrobial is, of course, uh, uh, nanoparticles of silver. Am I not correct? Yeah, that's correct. And as I understand it, and, and please, you, you certainly know much more about this than I, uh, silver is, is quite toxic to essentially a wide array, virtually all microbes, but not particularly toxic at all to people, at least at, at low levels. Let me just make sure this is stable. <laughs> okay, looks like it's pretty good. Okay. Um, all right, sorry. I, I don't want to like have that tilt in the background. Right. It'll be pretty stable. Um, <laughs> uh, so, can you please repeat the, your question? <laughs> so, I, I was just saying this is uh, it's impregnated with, with uh, silver nanoparticles, and the, the mechanism by which the silver is actually toxic to the, the microbes isn't terribly well understood, as, as, I, as I've read. Yeah, um, from, from what I understand, um, it's not, it hasn't been figured out the specific mechanism. There has been many observations that have been made by scientists, um, and some of these include um, disruption of the membrane structure mm -hmm. um, to the cells. So, like, it looks like there's holes that form. Um, Sorry, this is actually forming a little bit of a pressure seal tonight, so there is a better flow. <laughs> anyway, um, so so once the cells uh, have little, uh, so the contents start to leak out and the silver can bind irreversibly to DNA and proteins because of the strong linkages between sulfur groups on mm -hmm. them and silver itself, that forms a very insoluble 
um, compound um, that's well known in, uh, you know, silver chemistry. <laughs> okay, okay. And uh, so you, you sort of, uh, in your graduate work, you came up with this, this idea of putting uh, the silver nanoparticles into the paper. And then, then I suspect you had to spend some significant amount of time figuring out just how, how to get the silver in the right concentration and the right, uh, the right way into the paper. Yeah, um, so a lot of the project during my PhD was looking at not just one, but several different methods to um, add silver nanoparticles to paper, like there, you can you can think of many different ways, but a, so a chemist's job is to kind of figure out how many different ways, which ways work the best, which ways don't work so good. So I started with like, for example, a compound that was very reactive um, that had some toxic products, byproducts that worked really well, but I wasn't sure if that was good for the long run. So I started to work with non-toxic materials mm -hmm. um, to make the nanoparticles, and that's what we use today. Um, <laughs> But yeah, that, a lot of the PhD work was figuring out some of the basic um, synthesis methods and then group of concept in the lab, which means you test with lab-grown bacteria to see if they, um, you know, you, you hit the right concentrations for of silver. Um, so it's not too much silver in like the drinking water afterwards. You, you want, it's okay to have a little bit of silver in, right. but if you have too much, that can be not good for people. Right. <laughs> um, so it's like a fine balance you've got to work with there. Yeah, you've, uh, when I was talking with your uh, former, I guess one of your former professors, uh, Jim Smith, he said this, the same thing with his uh, Matty drops. He had to play around with the concentration so that they, they would come out just right in the water and be enough to be quite lethal to all microbes, but still only about a tenth of the level that the EPA considers safe for human consumption. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so, you started doing these, and then at some stage you must have begun to realize that this was going to be a worthwhile a product, you know, an actual, rather than just being graduate work, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, so basically, I, well, I graduated about uh, almost five years ago now for my PhD, and then you mentioned Jim Smith, he was uh, my first postdoc advisor when I was a postdoctorate. Uh, researcher at the University of Virginia, and at, that gave me an opportunity to work with well, someone who obviously knew a lot about working in developing countries. Is at that point, Jim had been to, I believe, Guatemala and South Africa. I'm not sure what other ones, but definitely those two. Um, and he had a lot of experience with taking uh, innovative technologies to the field, um, as you're well familiar with. Um, and one of the things I did in that postdoc was going to South Africa and seeing really what life could be like in some of these rural poor, poor areas and seeing how well this filter worked in that setting with like water sources that you know, people did drink from without any sort of purification. And so that was, you know, obviously very eye-opening and <coughs> um, basically I saw, oh wow, this actually could be effective, but I need to kind of you know, alter the design and look at what makes sense for what people would use, like, in their household. And this was not the design that we had back then. This is a modified, updated version. The version back then was a little, like, lab, much smaller. It's, like, more what you use to characterize something in a lab setting, so. Yes, indeed. So, uh, and then it, as you've developed this, you also, of course, face this problem, and we were discussing this the other day, about sort of scaling up production, right? Because these paper filters will, each one will filter so much water, but at some point you basically, it's, it's done, it's got a, a relatively limited life, right? It is paper. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and <clears throat> so you're trying to produce, ultimately, uh, the, you produce it in these booklets, uh, and, and here's a picture I guess we have on now of the, uh, uh, the one of your current production machines rolling out uh, rather rather impressive quantities of the, the, the folio paper. So um, <coughs> at, at each stage, I'm sure as, as you're sort of doing this differently, the way in which you get the paper uh, impregnated with the, with the silver must vary. You must have to sort of reconfigure your whole process sort of at, e at each scale up step. 
Has that been a, a challenge? Um, well, yeah, of course, but it's something that luckily the, the technology to start with worked out pretty well that each scallop hasn't been as bad as, I don't know, it hasn't been something we couldn't do, I guess is the best way to put it. Um, so <coughs> um, the scallop first started from me going from making tiny little squares that are yay big. Um, it's something that you could cook in a, you know, a lab oven or prepare in lab equipment, um, which is usually small scale, up to something that would that I did actually in a commercial kitchen, in the church kitchen, which used big bacon trays size of paper. Mm -hmm. um, and now it's just on a paper machine. So this is like our bound pack of papers, just shrink wrapped. But it, it's just, a, I don't have any rolls with me, but it's just like a big roll of paper that's this color. And um, it, this stuff could be made much, much quicker now. We've made way more paper this past year than, you know, at any year before that, for example, um, like in the tons scale, not in the, um, I guess, pounds, grams. <laughs> so, you know, orders of magnitude bigger. But um, yeah, the scale up there, uh, the process has changed a little as it does, but, you know, it still was something that the, even the first time that we tried it on the paper machine, we still had something that we're like, hey, that looks like it's not so bad. And, you know, it, it's something we could work with. And now it's even better as we've done this a few times um, using industrial paper machine equipment. Excellent, excellent. So, um, are, are you, I know there's a bunch of interesting stuff going on. There's, there's lots of different approaches now to this idea of filtering and purifying water. Um, there, there's this wonderful, these foliar filters that you've got. There's Jim Smith's thing, uh, the, the Matty Drops, which of course are not a filter in any sense. They will leave murky water murky. They will kill off the microbes, uh, as, as yours does, but yours, yours filters it as well. You deal with sort of two liter quantities at a time in yours. Uh, I was uh, viewing, a, a talking with a, a young gentleman from uh, uh, South Carol of uh, Southern California last week who, uh, and his colleagues have developed a little sort of cylindrical sort of filter that can run 380 gallons a day or something through it. Uh, yeah. And so, yeah, there's all these different things that I think it goes to show there's not a sort of one size fits all solution here. There are different different people are going to need different amounts of drinking water at different times for different needs, right? Yeah, and different cultures, too. <laughs> right. Sure. Yeah. And it matters if you're on your own or if you're it's a whole family. Are you sort of in one stable spot or are you having to carry the water with you? All these things will come into play as to, as to what, what's, uh, what's great. And what's, what's really impressive, I think, is these technologies are very uh, appropriate that is, they're very, all of them, the ones I'm seeing now are, are these quite low-tech uh, sorts of, uh, of things where they're, they may be based on very high-tech nanotechnology, but they're very simple to use for the end user. And that's, that's really critical because things like yeah. reverse osmosis is just way too complicated uh, for a, a lot of the, the settings where people are most in yeah. need of the water. I can say from my own experiences that I've worked with now a couple of industrial designers, <laughs> um, and there's, uh, it's not, a, industrial designers don't always go into this sort of market, just as scientists don't always go into this sort of, you know, like this is a, a kind of, um, well, for, for lack of a better term, a, a low profit making <laughs> endeavor for the most, most part, it's people do it because they're passionate about helping others. But I've, I've met many industrial designers that have been like, oh, I don't want to make just the latest flat screen TV or, you know, <laughs> the newest chair or whatever. And have been interested in solving like this sort of problem. And this design came out of, it wasn't exactly what we had from the industrial designers, but it was influenced by a lot of their work. Um, and it combined with engineering designers too. Like, so, it, you know, it, 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 this is not, just me who made this. I'm not going to take credit for that, but it's taken a team to come up with uh, this idea. And it, this is actually our first version. We have a new and improved version that's going to be done in a couple of months. Once. Excellent. <laughs> we're we're going to have to jump out for a short break here. Uh, Dr. Terry Denkovich uh, from Folio Water, CEO, founder of Folio Water, is on uh, via Skype with us today on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Ethan Allen, and we'll be right back.
Aloha, I'm Kaui Lucas, host of Hawaii is my mainland every Friday here on Think Tech Hawaii. I also have a blog of the same name at kauilucas.com where you can see all of my past shows. Join me this Friday and every Friday at 3 p.m. Aloha. Okay, I'm here with Brent Obergaard of the Faculty of the School of Journalism in the Department of Communications at UH Manoa. We've had a number of shows. We have a movable feast going on, and we talk about journalism, we talk about language, we talk about communication in general, and we talk about the effect of that on the country and on individual people. Brent, it's so good to, to be able to discuss this with you in our movable feast. Oh, it's my pleasure. This is a great opportunity. You'll have to come back again and again, okay, deal? Uh, that's the deal. Brett Obergaard, <laughs> I'm Jay Fidel. We care about everything. Thanks. <laughs>
maybe a little bit more in 2000. Yeah, no, that's <laughs> that's uh, still it's it it makes a real uh, real difference in people's lives. Uh, I've, I've had colleagues get gastrointestinal illnesses traveling in uh, the uh, islands here, and it's no fun at all. Uh, um, and so, so what do you, uh, do you produce any uh, uh, educational materials with these or do you just sort of figure that people are going to know how to use them? No, no, we, we um, some people are, some people understand very intuitively upon seeing the demo, they're like, yeah, that's easy. But we don't want people to be confused once we're not there. So this is the inside of our packet. It's basically just a picture telling you how to do it. Excellent. And then down here, oh, oops, let me fold it over. You can see this is just how to fold into a cone and then kind of guidance on when to change the filter and when it's okay to use. Uh -huh. So people will feel, like we do also recommend, you know, based on 100 liters, but most people don't remember how many liters they filtered, so that's not necessarily the best guidance. And um, on the back right now, we just have a cartoon that one of our friends made that explains the science behind it. It, it does have words in English, but, you know, eventually we'll get that in foreign languages as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's mostly a cartoon. Um, but this is, this is kind of, this is like our first um, product that we're selling. It, this is the third prototype. Um, we've had, a, a, as a lot of people have heard on the news, the three couple book version that I worked with, um, a nonprofit called Water is Life a couple of years ago. Um, and, <laughs> excuse me, that, that was written in English and Swahili, and um, I can show that to the camera too. Um, so you can kind of see that. And this one, um, the, unfortunately, the cover is actually very expensive to make, um, and the filter sizes aren't um, optimal. They're kind of small, so we're, we've moved beyond that. It's more of a first first version mm -hmm. to the the newer one, and we're still learning how to best print on the paper um, at mass production scales. So maybe in a few months we'll get that sorted. <laughs> so right now we're just gonna print on the the packaging and. Maybe in the future we'll we'll get the mass production of the print in sorted as well. And, and and so you you have this. You've got your website up where you sell the the, the packets and all. Uh, what are your plans? I mean, how do you want you want to scale this up and begin to really distribute these more broadly? Uh, yeah. How do you how do you see yourself going about that? So right now we've been working with a lot of smaller um, nonprofits and church groups. Like uh, for example, we've worked with a medical clinic that um, is run by a doctor here in Pittsburgh, and the medical clinics in Honduras, um, in a mountainous area. And we've also worked with Rotary groups that often go to various countries and do water projects. Um, and that's like basically to start to get the word out, but we really, our goal is to move up to local distributors in country that can distribute to like either pharmacies, grocery stores, corner stores, and get it so it's a sustainable supply chain because we're recommended to change the filter. Well, it depends on how many people are using it, but every week to every couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, you can buy the packet, but if you are you know, using it a lot, you're going to want to be able to get it locally, not just through through sure, our website sure. or through some somebody that comes from the U.S. to, you know, whatever country. Um, <coughs> excuse me. One of the pushes that we're trying to make right now is um, into, like, the Dominican Republic and Haiti, and there's problems in both countries. Uh, I mean, the aftermath of Hurricane Matthew is still a problem that hasn't received as much attention since um, October, really, but it, there's still like hundreds of thousands of people who have lost everything um, because of that hurricane. And, you know, basic necessities are really what you need first. So right. that's one of, one of our first steps um, for this year. And so I, I like really wanted to stress that one. Um, and we have someone that's um, really focusing on that area in our company as well. Yeah. It's, uh, sometimes uh, these areas get very hard hit. We've just had uh, uh, one of the islands that I work on uh, got hit by a water spout, which is very unusual, and it just went over it and really destroyed, a, you know, ripped the path of destruction across the island. Fortunately, it was, wasn't very wide, but it, it, and even was in its path, was pretty well wiped out. And so these people lost rainwater catchment systems and roofs yeah. off their houses and all that kind of stuff. Um, so how will you know 
when you have succeeded in this business? Well, I, I, I think in the short run, we'll know when we've sold a bunch of products that if people use them right, they're going to get clean water. Mm -hmm. um, if we start to look at it more as a business, we'll have to look at it as a certain amount of growth per year and you know the whole return on investment and so on and so forth, the business metrics. But, you know, our, our background is more from the, the heart of the social enterprise um, side of things, more than the for-profit, just pure business. So we're, we're going to look at things, how we, how we make impact on people's lives. And that's hopefully more than just clean water, but better health, yeah. less disease. And it's a little bit harder to measure, but, <laughs> you know, we're hoping to work with partners in the university to, um, like, public health doctors and people like that to help understand some of those impacts better. Sure. One, one of the things we're doing uh, to, to look at this issue is looking at uh, school attendance rates and seeing if, if when they get clean water sources, does school absenteeism drop? Uh, yeah. Because basically, if fewer kids are sick for fewer days, you should see you should see a nice uh, increase yeah. in school attendance. And that, that's, uh, and again, that's, that's sort of a win-win-win, right? The kids are healthier. They're spending more time in school. They're learning more. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's everyone's advantage and then their parents also don't have to stay at home with them too so they can also earn more money with their jobs too exactly exactly so uh, what, what would what advice would you give to uh, uh, aspiring scientists who, who want to uh, make an impact in the world just very briefly well I think uh, I got to where I was because I didn't give up like, there's so many points along the way that I could have chose to do something else that would have been maybe, you know, paid better. It would have been, I don't want to have to work as much. I feel like I work a lot of hours, a lot of the days. Um, and, but I, I like what I do. So that's, it, it doesn't, you know, it, it's not a negative one. Excellent. Uh, so I think you have to believe in it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sherry. I, I've really enjoyed talking with you. Learned, learned a lot, as I always do on the show. 